And uh, maybe to get started, um, I look after IML and MLOps in Canonical from product management side. And together with me, I have Maciek. We've talked before, right? <laughs> Yes, I think we've met. So uh, let's start a little bit from telling everyone what the AI factory is. So you might know Dell well as a company providing server storage, networking, and basically hardware boxes. And we were doing that for many years quite successfully. And now we saw early adopters of AI building their infrastructures from our hardware and having a lot of issues with that, with things like GPU utilization getting a bit higher in terms of how much they can use the infrastructure. It went to that level of extreme that some people were having like 10,000 GPUs with 20% utilization, which basically means you have very expensive 2,000 GPUs. And it didn't make sense for us. And that's why we decided to uh, work together with open source ecosystem with all you guys here and multiple other partners to build something that is ready made to be consumed by an enterprise. So a joint solution of infrastructure software pieces, everything related to infrastructure management, Kubernetes clusters, observability, plus the ML parts like Kubeflow and MLflow and all the services there as like one single package. I see you're giving a sneak peek into the tech side, Maciek, but I have a question before. When it comes to the, to the use cases, is there any focus or it aims to really enable organizations to move past experimentation in general? So there are multiple flavors of the AI factory. We started in the beginning of this year, announced it with NVIDIA, like the main bigger play for CSPs, because they were the early adopters, people building big clouds to be consumed by someone else. And for them, it was fairly easy to get into that stack because they have a lot of stuff which is experienced in managing infrastructure. They have access to ready-made reference architecture designs and things like that. And this is not very tricky because there is not a lot of legacy. This were greenfield projects, super easy. But now we started looking after the use cases which are more uh, complex in the enterprises and people trying to do multiple things with that. And that's why many flavors of the AI factory. That makes sense. And I think that's going to evolve as projects mature for sure. But then looking at the Dell AI factory, I think, and of course I have an insight, but it really addresses issues or challenges beyond deployment. Yeah, so what was important for us is to first of all validate the entire stack. So what we are doing, we are building all of those AI factories, not as like architecture blueprints that appear somewhere on the website. We are actually physically building them in our labs, running a rigorous testing cycle with a lot of performance tests. So we take like latest Plama model, 70 billion parameters, simulate 100 users doing rack on that system. We know what's the time for the first token, how much uh, quality of the response you get, and all of these metrics are available before you make a decision. Because there is a huge amount of choice, both in hardware and software, and it's not really clear what you need for a certain use case. With that kind of proper benchmarking, you can just go and browse, OK, this is what I'm going to do. That's what I need. Like Basically, simplify uh, the time to adoption. And what you asked about the day one and day two operations is where you guys are helping us the most. Uh, because obviously, besides deploying this, it needs to be maintained for a couple of years to bring you the ROI. So running that and operationalizing it together with like security patching, upgrades, and making sure that the lights are on, uh, that's where we rely on automation and open source software. But that's not ever going. You started this talk by talking about the GPU utilization and how the resources are underutilized. And whether we talk at the soft, we look at the software stack where we have schedulers, or we look at the hardware stack there. There is an objective that the DLI factory has to ensure that organizations stop underutilizing the infrastructure underneath. But that is not just for Nvidia, right? No, that's something that is available for multiple types of silicon. So you can freely choose your poison and decide of how your environment should look like depending on the use case. But where the importance of the utilization is coming from uh, integration between the hardware and the software. So on the Kubernetes layer, on the scheduler level, things like Volcano on the open source world or Run AI, ClearML, or all the other tools that are available there. This is super important, but also the observability on top of that. Because in order to actually max the utilization, you need to know what's happening right now. The configuration and the split of GPUs in mix slices and your networking might be good in the morning, but in the afternoon where there are different things running on top of the infra, you need to dynamically be able to change that configuration. That's where the automation comes in. 
There is one more thing that I would like to add here, since you you mentioned about the differentiated com- differentiated com vendors, and it's really the portability of the software stack. I know that one of the reasons we look for open source is the ability to run it on any hardware type and any silicon vendor, getting the same experience, first of all, and then maximizing the performance. Yeah, getting it to the extreme level, we have people running all types of silicon, not only the popular ones, but also uh, more niche accelerators like Grok, Sambanova, Cerebras plus a public cloud in a hybrid scenario, all managed by one software stack. So that's like really an extreme case. Not happens, it doesn't happen very often, but it was also cool to see that this type of things are possible with open source. I can tell you're still passionate about innovation and getting at the edge of technology. But let's move further on to what does it actually mean for industry leaders, for organizations who are looking to build their ML use cases? Because whereas a lot of organizations have been experimenting for a long time, either on-prem, on smaller clusters, or on the cloud. These days, they're looking to productize it. And is that already available? Yeah, so that's something that is already available in the market in all of geographies. And uh, what's also a little bit boring, but very useful for the companies, all of the like legal hassle, compliance hassle, delivery, and that kind of things is already sorted out. So basically, that's something that you can uh, almost order click on a website and get delivered in a box, which is pre-integrated. So all the racks are built up, software is installed, you just plug in the power, network connectivity, water for your direct liquid cooling, and you are good to go. Now the question is, is anyone going to order one? But before we get into that, I still get questions about Gen AI and RAG and all those use cases. Is the AI factory um, <laughs> helping on that front? And Yes, so that's now my time for the tricky questions because obviously uh, this is like a logical diagram how a Rack chatbot build properly could look like for a lot of users, bigger data set, like with set of models so that the question goes to a simple model in the beginning, as yes or no, historical questions, then maybe routing it to a proper expert model, different databases being used, different Rack pipelines. So, that's a complex environment, but this is a logical diagram. So how this would look from the software perspective? Well, looking before we moved into that, I think it's important to mention that such a diagram needs to address a large number of users as well as a growing volume of data. Now you have a T terabytes there, but that's going to grow. Now looking at the software stack, it all starts with the silicon vendors that we already talked about. And we should add the operating system on it. Mark already talked about it. And it's the foundation of an end-to-end platform that covers such needs. In the nowadays world, of course, we do have Kubernetes. Um, but looking at the hardware, uh, we do need to ensure the optimization is needed. So what do we have on the on the slide, Maciek? Yeah, so that's one of the Dell validated designs. There are multiple of them, as mentioned, for uh, different types of uh, silicon in it and different software stacks, but this is more or less how it looks like. So the, all of these software components being installed, tested, and benchmarked, and uh, with collaboration between us and Canonical, we are able to guarantee the quality and guarantee also the fact that this is something that will be operational for multiple years ahead with the LTS promise on the software. While being secured as well, which is important when it comes to different use cases. Um, but is that, I mean, I'll ask actually, is that the only use case? Because nowadays we see a lot of AI sovereign clouds. And if you look at the um, the image uh, before, that is a cloud almost, right? What, do you, what, are, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so the tricky part is that we are getting asked by the customers that, OK, we are a big enterprise. We have different types of users. We have people who just want to consume the large language model. They want a chatbot window, everything being done for them. OK, so this is one way of how you can access your GPUs and get your cloud, but there will be teams that actually want to fine tune their own models, uh, tune the rack pipelines or build some prompt manipulations into their setup. They would need an MLOps platform. So that's also another way how they would uh, consume the hardware that is there. More and more advanced people will have their own idea how the MLOps platform would look like. They want to pull in the pieces of the software that they want, not a ready-made platform. So they would ask for a dedicated Kubernetes cluster that still has all the benefits in terms of GPU sharing. It has benefits in terms of like automated upgrades, but they want to be in control of what software runs on top. And last but not least, there will be 
places which are working with very secret data or like three letter agencies that they don't even want to tell you if they use Kubernetes or not. They want their own dedicated bare metal resource pool. And like, we will do the rest, don't look there. So these are the ways how uh, these clouds are being consumed by different enterprises and public sector spaces. But the question is, okay, this is again a logical picture. So how do we do it in reality? Let me move towards the next slide, but this reminds me of the fact that there is no such a thing as an out-of-the-box ML solution and different organizations, different use cases have their own approach. And that's exactly what this uh, image showcases. However, if you look at how Canonical and Dell is working together, we really focus on the different types of hardware and we want to ensure the same user experience and the same um, performance. On top of the hardware itself, um, we'll have bare metal or MAS I know we have some mass fans in the in the audience for uh, provisioning. And then we add Kubernetes. Of course, we prefer canonical Kubernetes. But the truth is that our cloud native application portfolio runs on any CNCF conformant Kubernetes. And what we are looking for is to enable the whole machine learning lifecycle from developing models which with tools such as Kubeflow to um, famous frameworks such as State, TensorFlow, or PyTorch to then optimize the models. And that's where Katib, for example, is important, but also depending on the use case, frameworks such as Paddle Paddle or Mindspore play an important role. And then last but not least, I always say there is no machine learning without deployment because the model should always end up in production, only if it performs as we expected. And that's where frameworks such as on one hand case server or NNX are important, but also the observability that much I already mentioned with Grafana and Prometheus are relevant. They are all validated on all hardware types. They, they run together and they are integrated to ensure the continuity and ease of operations for customers. But then... Yeah, so about the ease of operations, because this is more or less how your data and AI setup would look like in some cases. So you have the green part on the bottom, infrastructure, we know how to do it, that's cool. But the blue part looks super complicated. There are so many components so many tools, all of them different open source communities behind them. All of them needs to be interconnected, so data flows from left to right. And then I got into a day two, and I want to upgrade it. Like, how is this possible? How do I do that? Well, it goes back to um, our ability to run the entire machine learning lifecycle, as well as simplify the operations, whether we talk about storing the data in different types of databases, such as Postgres or MySQL, or I talk about automating machine learning workloads and building pipelines with Kubeflow pipelines, and then running the models in production. We cover it all with one solution that's fully open source. What is more important? It is that it is integrated, and then it's a plug-in, plug-out architecture. Often when people see this slide, they say that there are too many logos, and that's true. You don't need them all. It really depends on your use case, on the industry that uh, you're working on, as well as the expertise that you have in house, because we don't talk much today. But whereas AI is, is very fancy and everyone talks about it, there's still a skill gap on the market. So ensuring that you have the necessary capabilities to use such tools is important. But then why did we choose working together? I know the canonical and the partnership started a long time ago, but then when it comes to AML, there are some key differentiators that we've been jointly working on. And I covered a lot about the silicon agnostic part, how the LAI factory is validated on AMD at the moment, it works on NVIDIA, and we are working on other hardware vendors, but then we are also continuously testing jointly to ensure that the solution is working on one hand, but then also that it will be operable a long time because you don't have machine learning only for one day or one week. The aim is to have projects running in production long term. Maciek, is there anything else that you would like to add? I mean, for us, the biggest reason was to go where the users are. So if you look at the data science community, most of them, like really uh, far uh, more than a half uh, of data scientists, ML engineers, they are on Ubuntu on their workstations. They are starting to learn on this. Most of the tutorials that can find online are using that operating system, so it only makes sense to continue the stack whenever we are building bigger data centers, huge GPU farms, that's why the partnership. And as we continue innovating together, and as we talked about confidential computing, I think having a Dell AI factory on confidential computing is the next big step that we can jointly work into, look into. Coming soon. <laughs>
<laughs> I think that was it on our side. Uh, thank you, Maciek, for, for joining us. It's been a pleasure to have you. Thank you.